Okay, so the next topic I want to hit on is taxonomy versus phylogeny. Because these two things are confused a lot. Most of the way you think about how organisms are related to each other are taxonomies. Um, taxonomies are great. And, and this is where the understanding of relationships first, first developed, before people knew about evolution. So what is a taxonomy? A taxonomy is, a, is an artificial mechanism for grouping organisms, naming them, and identifying them. So let me give you an example of a taxonomy. Here's a taxonomy. I'll show the camera. This is a, this is a golden guy. I hate to tell you what year this is. I don't even know where this came from. Probably my mother's collection. I don't know. It cost 25 cents at the time. Um, if you see a wildflower, the purpose of this book is to identify it for you. Okay, so it groups organisms based on some traits, it gives you a name, and it's used for identifying them. What's the fundamental guide for how you identify them? The color of the flower. Okay, so you see a wildflower, you ask yourself, is it red, is it blue, is it yellow, or is it white? And if it's blue, you look up in the blue section, you go through and you can figure out what it is. Is there anything wrong with that? Yeah, well, for example, the, um, I looked it up. The, what's the weed that grows in cornfield? Morning glory. Shows up in all categories. Because the flower color is variable. Uh, what if it's, what if it's a black flower? You, you don't know where to look it up, right? Not very many of those. But there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's a, it's a pragmatic way to, to look stuff up. Here's another one. I use this a lot, obviously. This is Paul Human's uh, Reef Fish Identification, Florida, the Bahamas. And if you see a fish in the water, and it looks weird, and it's resting on the bottom, sure enough, you're going to go to the section called Odd-shaped bottom dwellers, okay? Now, is there any reason to think that a flounder and a frogfish are related to each other? Of course they are not. But for the purposes of identification, that's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it. Long silvery fish, right here at the beginning. I'm sorry, but tarpon and barracuda are not closely related to each other. Nevertheless, this is a useful guide. Another taxonomy that people use a lot. Um, how many of you or someone you know has a, has a shop where they've got those plastic bins with all different kinds of nuts and bolts and stuff in them? Almost everybody, right? I can't tell you how many I have. How do you sort things into those bins? It's a taxonomy, right? I've got one where I have all my woodworking stuff in it. And so it's got wood screws, it's got nails, it's got plugs, it's got all kinds of woodworking stuff in it. I've got another bin for metalwork, cars in particular. And so I've got lots of bolts and, and fasteners and, and all this kind of stuff for working on cars. In some cases, you might have almost an identical looking bolt in both things, right? But it's a useful way to separate them. Now, there's no reason to think that there's any relationship between any bolt and any nail. There's, I mean, the, the, these fasteners don't have any evolutionary history. They're not really related to each other in any way at all. And you can organize them in different ways. Some people might put all the stainless steel stuff in one bin and the brass stuff in another and the metal stuff in another. Plastic, maybe. Other people might put all the bolts with the same threads in them in one place. There are a variety of ways in which you could organize them, and they all fulfill these purposes. And there's nothing wrong with them. But they don't tell you anything about the evolutionary relationships between them. Unless that's built into the taxonomy that's being used. And it usually isn't. This is particularly relevant for microbiology because until a little while ago, there wasn't really any way to do this with bacteria. And so if you look at an old, even today, the Burgess Manual is something people use a lot. There's these dichotomous keys, right? Is it gram-negative or gram-positive? And it divides it out. 
That is no different than are the flowers yellow or purple. There is no reason to think that just because two organisms are gram negative that they're in any way related to each other. Likewise, gram positive. Rod shaped gram positive organisms come in all flavors and sizes and, and everything else. And there's not any relationship necessarily between any two gram positive or gram negative rods. So you have to think about bacteria in terms of their real, under, real um, relationship. But how do you do that? And why is that important? Why do you care about who an organism is really related to? How many of you have met someone new, someone you're interested in, spend some time with, and you go home and visit their families? Everyone's done this, right? Pretty nervous, right? It's nerve-wracking. It's awful. It's awful for a variety of reasons. But one of those reasons is that your significant other is going to learn more than you want them to know about you when you meet their family. You lose control over what information they have about you. You're not a grouse, but you remind them a little bit of that uncle who is. All of your different facets, all the facets of your personality and phys physicality and everything are reflected in various strengths in the members of your related family. That's pretty scary, isn't it? But it's also powerful. When you think about how this, this wonderful person, what they're going to look like when they're 70 years old, well, you've got, they've got three aunts and a mother right there, and that gives you clues. If you want to know something about an organism, the best place to look is to find out who they're related to and look at them. That's absolutely critical. If you compare them to a different family that maybe they have some superficial relate, um, a similarity to, you're not going to learn anything new. So for example, if someone looks at me and says, well, I've got blue eyes, so I'll compare them to other people with blue eyes, that, that doesn't give them any information. But if they look at my family, they look at my father, they look at my brothers, you're going to learn way too much about me. And so knowing what you're related to and knowing what someone's theme is related to is, is a powerful tool. It allows you to make predictions about things. If I have a colony on a plate and I do some kind of analysis and I discover that it is a lactic, it's related to lactic acid bacteria, I know a lot about it right there. I don't have to do a bunch of experiments. I know it's going to be, it's going to get its energy from substrate level phosphorylation because all lactic acid bacteria do. I know it's going to be, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a facultative anaerobic. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be pathogenic. Um, I, I just, I, it's going to be gram positive. It's going to have a particular cell wall structure. All this information, just because I know it's a lactic acid bacteria. In some groups, it can be very powerful. If I have something and I prove it's a cyanobacterium, I can tell you that it has the Z scheme. I can tell you exactly how it makes both energy and carbon. I can tell you, you know, about the Calvin cycle. I can talk to you about the membrane and, and, and its life cycle. There's a bunch of information because cyanobacteria have a lot of properties in common. In other groups, like the proteobacteria, it's a lot harder, where, where the organisms are a lot more diverse phenotypically. And so, for example, if you, if you find you know, some creature, um, in, you know, I don't know, embedded in amber or something, and you fish a bit of it out, and you discover it's a mammal, you know a lot about it already, right? You know it has hair during part of its life cycle. You know that it, it, it probably um, had, it drank milk as, as an infant. Um, there's a lot about the physiology. It's probably homothermic, right? And so forth. All of this you know just because you know what kind of an organism it is. Knowing the phylogeny is also important because it prevents you from making big, big mistakes. So for a long time, people used to study green plant photosynthesis in euglena. You guys know what euglena is? You probably saw it in high school. So it's this microscopic thing. It's kind of spindle-shaped, and it moves in an inch-like fashion or, or by flagella. 
this beautiful creature, it, it's also not a green plant. You know what, you know what euglena is related to? Trypanosomes, the organisms that cause sleeping sickness. If you want to learn about trypanosome molecular biology, euglena is a great model system. But if you want to study green plant photosynthesis, euglena is an awful system. Euglena acquired this chloroplast at some point in its evolutionary history by consuming a eukaryotic green alga. There are extra membranes around the chloroplast of, of um, the plastids in euglena. And there's a bunch of relics of that eukaryote left over in that plastid. It's a terrible model system to study photosynthesis in plants. If you want to study plant photosynthesis in, in a unicellular system, use, use a green plant. Use chlorella. Use, what's another one? I can pick up one up here. Chlamydomonas is a great one. Chlamydomonas is a green algae that is directly related to, to green plants. It's a great model system. You clean that's terrible. And yet people put, study you clean it for probably 100 years. All right, so, so phylogenetics is important. You can use taxonomies, but keep in mind in, for biological purposes that what you really want to study, what you want to know is the phylogeny.